Welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to invite you to this series, this series on ethics that we hold at Massey College. I first want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous lands. It is a treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit and has been inhabited by many indigenous communities over thousands of years. I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship towards this land and also the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. This ser series on ethics is part of a vision for Massey where I really want to support our junior fellowship continuing to become the ethical and inclusive leaders that they will be and equip them fully to reflect on the big issues of our society. And today we're talking about political spin. It should be uh, interesting not only to the people that are in politics uh, and also for all the citizens out there to try to understand what are the limits of political spin. So on this note, let me pass it to Tom Axworthy. Hello everyone, I'm Tom Axworthy, a public policy chair at Massey College and uh, co-chair of the uh, ethics series that uh, Natalie has just uh, referenced. So I want to begin um, with uh, Peter Burrow, who is the, the founder of Section One, a think tank dedicated to human rights and uh, democracy. Um, and Peter, the, the issue of truth uh, and communication has been with us a long time. Um, I remember one of the famous sayings of Mark Twain is that, a lie travels halfway around the world while truth is putting on its pants. And uh, today, uh, in a millisecond, uh, we have this avalanche of uh, disinformation on social media. So I'd like to turn it over to you. How, how large is the issue of truth, and in particular within political communication? Well, it's the, it, I mean, you know what my preoccupations are, Tom. First of all, let me thank you for, for having me on the panel. It's a real honor and a, and a pleasure to, to be talking about something this important and timely uh, uh, with, with you and the, and, and the good people at Massey College. Uh, the issue of truth and the way you framed it is, that, as you know, kind of a, one of my central preoccupations. Uh, when we talk about spin, uh, and, and I think it, it's, it's the central issue I, at least in my sort of sense uh, in today's discussion. When we talk about spin, we're talking about something which from the outset is, uh, you know, it was, it was defined as knowingly providing a heavily biased interpretation of a fact or an event, uh, whether in a campaign or in some other political context to influence public opinion for to achieve a certain public outcome. Um, there's no two ways about it. It implies manipulation and even deception uh when we talk about spin we're talking about deception whether whether that means lies outright lies or not is is an interesting question but i don't think it's the fundamental question because i don't think lying itself is the real problem in the context of this particular discussion i think we have to accept that lying is part of the uh, of the landscape, part of the background condition that exists inside our political discourse. Bernays, who you quoted uh, in in uh, in your uh, your promo piece for this event, you know, rebranded propaganda uh, as what he called public relations. He did that for good reasons because he understood very well that uh, that manipulation uh, and deception was at the core of 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 the skill set that he was uh, that he was uh, beginning to master and and to promote in fact you, you know the first example of 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 spin in the context of bernay's own legacy occurs when before he brands it you know the term comes up with the term public relations when he's serving the cause of uh, um, uh, of wilson's entry into world war one and uh and comes up with the phrase uh making uh, Europe fit for democracy uh, or introducing uh, democracy to Europe. Ultimately, it was all about uh, something quite different. Uh, it was really about protecting the financial interests of American 
business and banks that had made huge loans to the Allies in that in the wake of the Lusitania and, and the bombings uh, of uh, of submarine, you know, from the uh, German submarine warfare, uh, American business was really concerned about uh, losing. Um, that were suffering a terrible financial hit if the war was lost. And that really was the principal rationale uh, for Wilson's initial entry into the war. But it was all about, of course, explained as making the world safe for democracy. Um, when we talk about the ethics of spin, we really need to understand we're really not posing the question, is it ethical to lie and deceive? In a, in a liberal democracy, we agree, I think, that it's not ethical to lie or deceive, except perhaps in the context, and this may be kind of the litmus test for for spin that is ethical as opposed to, you know, having crossed and, mm -hmm. you know, a red line that none of us would accept, except where it may be in the public interest. And I hearken back to um, to uh, Socrates' use of the noble lie in, in Plato's myth of the metals in, in the Republic, and I won't get into that here, but, you know, the idea that when there is a higher purpose or some, you know, legitimate purpose, deception may be justifiable. Uh, we can think of all kinds of examples where that may be the case, and we can think of many more where it certainly is not. What distinguishes liberal democracies, of course, from other systems of government in, in, in this connection is that in all other systems and you know uh, truth is not a standard it doesn't provide any sort of baseline or universally acknowledged reference point against which political speech is judged the entire logic of liberal constitutionalism is predicated on the idea that truth or verifiability false about viability and indeed transparency of political statements are, are you know make up the sine qua non of political legitimacy so without those uh you know those um uh, features of political discourse, there can be no accountability. And accountability is really what's at the core of liberal constitutional government. And there can't be any accountability if there's no societal or collective deference to the authority of facts, knowledge, and truth. Self-regulation, self-restraint, the, the, the honor system is not how we in liberal democracies keep political uh, speech honest or political speech makers honest. It's not how we keep the media honest. We do it by exposing actors, speakers and speech to the critical scrutiny of our accountability systems through the filter of what we account, uh, you know, a combination of accountability systems, the filter of the uh, of, of the marketplace of ideas, um, along with various forms of institutional and political checks and balances that we've established through our laws and through our practice. So spin itself is never the ultimate sin. It's the cover up that's the sin. And it's the, uh, it's the uh, effort to conceal the truth seeking process, uh, or sorry, to, 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 uh, to frustrate the, the truth seeking process. You know, the, the integrity and viability of our democracy actually doesn't depend on anyone telling the truth. It depends on the systems and the culture of accountability doing that work. That's why we prize free speech. We don't, we don't uh, believe that officials should be able to punish false speech, except in the case of, for example, perjury or things like the promotion of hatred. Um, and the reason we, 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 we believe that is twofold. Number one, if we have a system in which that happens, which is what happens in, in autocracies, that we really end up punishing dissent. Where, in fact, you know, to take, you know, Orwell's insight, truth is falsity or falsehood and falsehood is truth. And what, what you know, in those societies, truth and the promotion of truth uh, is what's punished. Finally, let me just before kind of uh, ceding the, the floor to our next uh, panelist, let me say that uh, that all of this occurs against a back a backdrop of uh, of the of the degradation and diminished standing that truth has has now in our society, and that's a product really of two phenomena. One is the full frontal assault from both the right and the left in different ways and through different mechanisms and indeed for different purposes. The full frontal assault on the idea of truth itself or on truth, in which uh, you know ideology and political agenda is you know are paramount values uh, rather than the search for knowledge itself. The second is something I've spoken about elsewhere. I won't get into it here. Perhaps we might talk about it later. And that's 
that's the extent to which the problem of relativism, which really shakes the ground on which truth propositions stand, the problem of relativism is kind of baked into the epistemology of, of liberalism itself. Um, and we've moved really in a set in a sense from from moral relativism, which is, you know, asserts the essential subjectivity of all value systems. And actually, we think that's not a bad thing because liberalism is premised on the idea that people disagree on the final ends, uh, you know, of life, on the understandings of what is the good life, etc. Uh, but postmodernism, and this is an insight that Fukuyama uh, uh, came up with, uh, sort of has moved us further along from moral to cognitive relativism, where even factual observation is regarded as subjective. And this creates a real problem because now truth itself is 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 fairly, uh, you know, has been disturbed and, and displaced as a central uh, authority that 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 all kind of uh, uh, genuflect to. So I mean, it's a combination of all of these things. But let me let me leave my opening remarks there and we'll maybe come back to some of these uh, these ideas later. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, David Slowly, who's a, a, a political activist and has been a, a campaign manager uh, in the party system at various levels. And uh, uh, Peter uh, made several uh, points, but one of them he mentioned Plato's noble lie. Uh, and and that just struck me that when democracy was first uh, created in fifth century Athens, um, the ancient Greeks had a goddess of persuasion whose bastard son was rumor. And of course it was a uh, rumor which uh, the Athenian assembly uh, put Socrates to death. So right at the beginning of democracy, we've had uh, persuasion and we've had rumor mongering right from the start. So, uh, so David, uh, I, I want to ask you as someone who has been very involved in modern po political uh, communication, uh, is there a valid role in democracies for spin, for framing an issue? And when does that begin to veer off into some of the problems which we know when we have a, a Trump or a Boris Johnson who who lies just for the practice of it. We can't hear him. Uh, David, I think we, we've got some problem with your uh, sound at the moment we we can't hear you are you muted are you muted okay sorry hey. tom um spin's been around forever um but it's cheaper than ever to do in the past you might have to build a a monumental building or a statue um commodus built a statue uh, commissioned a statue of himself um as hercules and it was i believe in in front of the Colosseum in rome um but that that was relatively expensive. Uh, today, uh, it's it's a cheap and efficient spin is a cheap and efficient tool. Um, and in thinking about the question you you pose to us uh, and where I can contribute, I would say it's easier, more efficient. Uh, you get greater rewards for the wilder spinning that you do today. Um, most young people and many people in their middle years uh, or increasing numbers consume uh, political information from social media. Mm -hmm. And in social media, you get rewarded for the most extreme things you say, the most, the, the greatest emotional appeal, lifestyle oriented appeals that you can put into your spin, uh, which works against rational thought. It works against the notion uh, that I under my understanding of democracy that it's based on rational dialogue among citizens and consensus building through dialogue. Uh, but you know we live in the kind of world that um, you know Marshall McLuhan warned us about, where the medium is the message. Um, I think the underlying uh, an underlying question, an implicit question in in 
holding this 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 discussion on spin is what's different about today and is what mm. we're doing today is better than what we've done in the past i'd say we're in a, in a worse situation and part of it is the technological and cultural environment that is related to the technology that's available to us uh i have i like to talk to people of different age groups and and understand how they view politics i'm not doing a thousand samples so you know my ad hoc um questioning of people and their attitudes isn't uh, scientifically valid but when i talk to my social network um there are a larger and larger number of people who don't trust regular news they feel that um you know platforms like facebook um and twitter are more reliable but they have no concept that uh that what they see is curated um and that the things that that are fed into their feeds uh are uh selected by the, the extremity of um the ideas that are presented to them because it gets more attention so people are led off into if you're inclined to the right you're nudged to the to an extreme in the right uh if you're inclined to the left you're nudged to greater extremes that way um if you are green you're nudged to extreme green positions if you don't believe in climate change or you're climate skeptical or you're in favor of um the continued use of oil and gas you're nudged in the direction your your bias is a confirmed and reinforced so that would be my my contri opening contribution to the question of the ethics of spin good thank you david uh, mr enkin you've uh had a very distinguished career as a journalist, uh, uh, an executive uh, uh, editor of CBC News and uh, then CBC Ombudsman, and I believe uh, also worked on a program for training journalists and new standards in the, and, and, and uh, our, our world today. Uh, David has talked about uh, the profound changes of social media and, and uh, um, certainly in, in, in my lifetime of uh, of political communication it it has moved from a model where a one to one a person like you uh, and and an editor or a producer of a, of a newscast or editor of a newspaper has has decided what is news and then <coughs> has examined it taken it to to the reader or to the audience uh, a one to one model and davis described a uh, a many-to-many -many model where um, the new channels really have no standards that are that are recognized nor regulated. So tell us now, you're really at as a journalist in the in a, in a tough spot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I, how, do you, how do you go about it? <laughs> you know, well, you know, it's interesting, eh? Because there was a point at which we all thought this would be the great democratization because we as journalists could certainly, in mainstream media, could be faulted for uh, aligning itself with a certain worldview and, and not reflecting the, the realities or, or diversities of Canadians and, and bypassing it meant those voices would be heard. It hasn't quite worked out that way. And listening to uh, uh, both Peter and David, you know, I'm really struck by the fact. So I think journalistic purpose is to give citizens the information they need on issues that matter to them so that they can form their own opinions. And somehow that has been as partly largely through digital media and 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 social media that process has been seriously disrupted and i doubt that there has ever been a more difficult time to be a journalist dedicated to that mission so welcome to the age of information disorder i wish i'd come up with that but claire wardle did at first draft mm -hmm. and i think it's it is a wonderful description of the world we live in um I think it's apt and a useful shorthand to describe it. So, you know, I I, I was actually almost taken aback, Peter, at, the, at your sort of completely negative um, definition of spin. I guess I'm just part of the system enough. I, uh, I think that spin is, of course, as we all agree, always existed. But as we've all pointed out in this particular age, it becomes more dangerous, more insidious, <laughs> and way more efficient at bypassing any filters. Um, so 
I've always understood spin when it's at its most benign as the game reporters and sources play. That's kind of the system I grew up into. You have an agenda. I'm going to do the best I can do as the journalist to frame the story in the most honest way I can, no matter how you would like me to present it. That's that's the kind of balancing act. So individuals and institutions want to be able to define the context and parameters of a story or control the narrative, which is a critical piece of it. Um, and that's uh, how you get to deliver your own message. And there's always a degree of, any, of manipulation in any journalistic transaction, even when there's excellent reporting. I can think of it a very a current example. For example, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, going back, it's grown exponentially, but the, but the story about uh, Chinese interference in our last two elections, uh, the CSIS leaker, let's let's go back to the beginning of the story. We don't know who that is. We don't know who gave the globe a selective look at documents. We don't um, and we don't know, um, you know, what what motivated it. Sometimes with whistleblowers, we do and we're obliged to say what it is. And then it's how the story gets framed, which is where the spinmeisters come into it. Right. Is the story is the issue, the interference by a foreign power? Or is the issue who knew what, when? Well, it's both, of course, but where you put the emphasis depends on who's telling the story. And I can give other examples, and I think I'm going to skip some of them now, and um, maybe we can go back to them uh, when we when we have more discussion. Uh, and I guess the response to all of this is, and I, and I don't mean this uh, it, you know, in any way facetiously, is to commit excellent journalism, to apply critical thinking, to be clear to your audience about where you get information, what you know, most importantly, what you don't know. So there's always an agenda. The antidote, of course, is to make sure that you ensure all relevant perspectives are represented. Um, you know, spinmeisters have always had many tools in their to toolkit. Uh, the timing of the release of information, controlling who gets what, having preferred reporters, intimidating others. You can freeze them out. Um, you can, of course, I, I think Peter alluded to this, you can be selective in the material you release, be selective in your facts, and more, very importantly, use particular language to invoke a response. That's, you know, whoever get, gets to define it first kind of puts the frame around it. The frame and context are so critical in journalism. And you know that use of language like that is known as dog whistling. And that's the way it's always worked, still does. But now the whole system, as others have said, is on steroids. You don't even need news outlets to time the release of your information. You can create all kinds of attention using social media, as you're all aware. It's, a, it's an incredibly fast way to control a narrative. And again, it's been called viral sloganeering. And I think in terms of spin, probably one of the most pernicious and terrible tools because it's hugely efficient. Right? It's it just exponential. You repeat your message, the message becomes truth or it defines the terms of the discussion. Um, uh, so, you know, and spin is not exactly the same as different disinformation, I don't think, but it certainly mm -hmm. is flourishing in this environment. Uh, and the lines every day are blurring, especially in the techniques to get ideas out there. So whether by means foul or fair, use of bots, closed reporting system, closed information systems, um, it just makes everything worse. You can get a story out with, uh, without a reporter. So that accountability mechanism is completely gone. Um, you know, and then the other thing is for people who are spinning this, the whole idea of making your story go viral is the first part of it. But, but the second part of it is that then attracts the interest of mainstream media, which as much as a lot of these folks disdain, it actually amplifies the story even further. And we saw that certainly in the Trump years, and there's been lots of ink spilled on how to, how it should or could be dealt with, which is that the fact is mainstream media picks up stories because everyone's talking about it. And even if they're reporting it just to debunk it, it's still useful amplification. Um, and so, you know, makes leaks of human information, human uh, leaks from one person to another, like next to nothing. Um, I want to talk about some possible solutions, um, but I want to also talk a little bit about some of the way uh, spin works, especially in digital media. Frequently, you know, context and framing, as I said, is so critical. Frequently, information is taken out of context. So what does truth mean? You can have a, there was an example I read, of a, it's a true picture. It was during the, uh, 
um, the ongoing uh, argument in the United States around uh, immigration and people crossing the border. And it was a tweet sent out with a picture of a child in a cage saying, this is what happens when uh, governments believe uh, people are illegal. Uh, and indeed, it, the, it was a true not doctored photo, but it was actually a piece of agitprop that had been used at a demonstration in favor of and against the, the then Trump government policy of separating children from their parents. Um, and the person apparently who, who spun it that way did it in all good faith, not so it was misinformation or disinformation, but there you go, right? It, it, it suddenly it's viral and it's correct information in an improper context. And think of all the ways that can be used. And it apparently was, it was, uh, you know, repeated, tweeted 10,000 times, uh, 20,000 times on, it was retweeted and it was, it was shared 10,000 times on Facebook. So think about all the ways that can happen when it's even more deliberate. This was accidental, you know, and in the last decade or so, journalists have created hundreds of fact checking organizations, really good think tanks and institutes have been working feverishly to come up with countermeasures and practices against this, this uh, viral spin. Um, so what are the ethical obligations of practitioners? Some of it goes back to journalism 101, which also should be on steroids at this point. It is easy to think that you can get the pulse, find the perfect quote through social media. It's certainly a useful tool, but nothing is as good as showing up, actually being there, watching, observing, asking questions face to face it may take you to places you didn't know you were going to go or that you didn't know about. And forgive me for stating the obvious, but I think it bears repeating and it bears repeating in a you know, a dire um, environment of cutbacks uh, where reporters don't get out very often or as often as they should. Um, and, you know, there are other techniques, you know, if you're forced to uh, uh, repeat uh, something that you know to be untrue as part of the narrative, uh, then there are ways of, I mean, one, one uh, US reporter called it a truth sandwich. You know, you state a fact, you, say what the incorrect information is, and then you give another factual statement that really tries to explain why it's a lie. Um, and the theory is in that way, people will begin to have their own way of, of assessing the information and that what will stand out is the truth. I'm not convinced, but it's an, an interesting way of looking at it. Um, you know, I think uh, but one and one thing that has not changed but become so much worse, and one of the ways I think politicians have always uh, control and and other people in fiduciary or other forms of, of accountability is they simply won't answer your question. Well, you know um, now and now they can get their information information out in another way. I cannot tell you how much it has struck me again and again, both in being on juries uh, for uh, various journalism awards and in my time as ombudsman, to find out how many times whoever was being held accountable simply refused to respond. Or how many times have you heard this in an email statement, right? Well, mm. reporters send emails and then, I mean, it's, it's the old thing. Everybody's ever had any media training knows you just give your message, give your message. But, you know, not being able to follow up, not to see body language, not to do any of that, to just, uh, you know, one wonders the value of even including those anodyne statements. And we had many discussions in my newsroom about whether you did or you didn't. And I think we finally ended up saying, you know what? Yes, you have to send the questions. You have to prove you've done everything to try to get that accountability and the other side of the story. But let's not be trapped by it. And let's warn people, if should they choose to only answer email and not grant an interview, we reserve the right not to report what they've said because it's not it's not critical, right? It's not, it doesn't, uh, rather not critical, it's not, it's not relevant. It doesn't answer the questions. So I can go on forever, but yeah, I know, yeah, no, no. I to say, I'm gonna very quickly wrap up. I'm saying, I'm not sure I know what the answer is. And there are times, you know, and listening to Peter didn't make me feel any better. It's easy to despair. But I also know that there are many publications in this country still managing to do excellent, managing to do excellent journalism. And Gary Kasparov famously said, the point of modern propaganda, and I think we can use the substitute spin here, is not only to misinform or push an agenda, it is to exhaust your critical thinking to annihilate truth. 
And as long as we, you know, try to commit to transparency and rigor, I hope we can preserve the integrity of our journalism. Thank you, Esther. Just uh, as you mentioned, uh, the current uh, uh, issue around uh, Chinese interference in our elections and uh, CSIS, I was reminded of the famous quote of Scotty Reston from the New York Times that the, the ship of state is the only ship that leaks from the top. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we're certainly seeing that uh, now as that as yeah. that issue plays out. Yeah. But, I, but I wanted to, to, to throw out to the panel for comment, whether this is uh, makes sense or not, that, that when we look at and uh, referencing points that all of you have made, that there is political spin which has always been with us and which is one trying to put the best possible frame on an argument that you support. Uh, th the next graduation may be misinformation, which is either deliberate or inadvertent in that uh, process. And then the third analytic, I think, is lying, where you know what the fact and the truth is and you deliberately decide uh, to, to, to go into a different direction. And, and uh, in, in trying to make an ethical evaluation of how our parties and others are operating, is that kind of distinction important, which is we all expect, as Esther just said, uh, uh, parties or uh, promoters to put the best possible light on their argument. And that is different again from people inadvertently posting misinformation. And that's different again from people who deliberately try to mislead and each requires a different response does that does that make sense uh, peter you're our an, an analytical uh uh master well i don't know if i'm a master of anything but let me uh, respond to that let me also say to esther that i wasn't trying to be gloomy um uh, I, I i i don't think spin is the problem i don't no, think I spin agree. itself is I the problem in fact i don't think the degree of moral turpitude you know at play in the dishonesty in question and i i'm going to come back to that i think there is deception if not outright dishonesty even in even in the best even in the best of cases that's not the problem it's the problem of accountability which you esther did talk about let's just take a look at some examples to see whether uh, a sliding scale approach really works or or as i would submit doesn't work to me, it's about the background condition, all right? What I'm gonna say is that if the accountability mechanisms and if the culture of accountability, which depends on the importance of truth, the high standing of truth in, the, in, in civil society, if that has been degraded, I think we're in deep trouble. It doesn't mean you know doom and gloom. It means we've got some serious work to do to address that. But let's look at some examples. Crowd size at the presidential inauguration of Donald Trump. That was a clear lie about, you know, how many people were there when Kellyanne Conway or, 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 or Spicer, uh, you know, declared that that it was the biggest crowd ever for any president. It was very easy to check whether or not that lie, <laughs> you know, could pass. You know, all you needed was an aerial photograph to see that that was a lie, and that was the end of that story. And it was silly. But let's look at the situation where, for example. The election was stolen. The election was stolen. The 2020 election was stolen. And we see that refrain reverberate in, in uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil and elsewhere in the world, right? Um, that's, that's an interesting one because that one is also equally capable of being falsified, refuted, verified. All right, so the accountability systems actually to ascertain whether that statement is false or not are present. And in the United States, there was a very robust and multidimensional sort of set of accountability mechanisms that put the lie to that lie that the election was stolen. However, the problem becomes the debasement of truth as any sort of authoritative standard so that even the lie is not important and neither is the truth. Uh, so that you have millions of people who uh, who are willing to either believe the lie or are happy to stand by it for political purposes in blatant disregard, all right, of the obvious truth. Now, 
Those are examples in a liberal democracy. There's one more I want to give in a liberal democracy, and then we'll I want to move to to an autocracy. The government of Canada was merely trying to protect 9,000 SNC Lavalin jobs when the PMO spoke to the Attorney General about a deferred prosecution agreement for the company SNC Lavalin. Right now, that was an absolute blatant falsehood. Uh, I can't speak to what was in the heart of the prime minister when he made the statement. Perhaps at some level he believed that jobs were at stake. But we know that the CEO of SN Lavalin uh, denied that anyone from the company ever raised the prospect of job, jobs, job losses resulting from criminal prosecution of the company for fraud. Right? And we have good reason to believe, based on public hearings, right, that there were other considerations. Right? the electoral fortunes, the political fortunes of the government, the government of the day in the province of Quebec and in the country as a whole as a result of how that story was spun. So there's, I'm going to just leave that example out there and perhaps some of you might want to chew on it. Now let's contrast that to uh, an obvious, well, there's one more in a liberal democracy, Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. We know that people were sent into war. We know that America uh, and and the UK under Blair, who joined Bush, went to war uh, and deposed Saddam Hussein on the basis of what was uh, faulty intelligence, if you want to put a positive spin on this, uh, or an outright lie. Now let's contrast that with the war in Ukraine. The Nazification of the uh, Ukrainian government and leadership as some kind of a pretext to send Russians into war to liberate Ukraine from uh, from that kind of a a corrupt and and, and terrible government. Uh, the idea that Zelensky and the Ukrainians were intent on de-Russifying not only Ukraine and the Donbas but Russia itself. Right. So those are two statements which don't require any kind of accountability mechanism in a liberal constitutional context uh, to to be upheld, to be validated, because in that kind of a system, an autocratic dictatorship, uh, a tyranny, in fact, um, the lie is upheld and enforced by the state, right? And it's the truth that is punished, right? Not the lies. So those are just just a few examples of different kinds of, you might want to call them spin. We know they're falsehoods that are peddled by political leadership. One more thing I'd say, Esther, is that you were quite rightly speaking about the role of journalism. And I see journalism, of course, as being part of the accountability mechanism, although it's also fair to say that journalists spin as well. Um, the good ones who are ethical are really trying their very best to give an honest account of the state the state of play, right? But we as human beings, you know, interpret the world, right? It was what Popper or someone else said, there are no facts, there are only interpretations of facts, right? I mean, the ability, you know, objectivity doesn't arise from honest people doing their best to be objective. It arises from a society of friendly critics, of a plurality of multiplicity of voices and of eyes on the, on the activity coming together this is the operation of the free market, you know, in which, of course, uh, sorry, the, the marketplace of ideas, not the free market. Please don't don't let me be taken to have confused those two issues. Um, you know, it's the operation of the marketplace of ideas in which, you know, the, the free press is obviously the chief actor. But as you pointed out, given, you know, the democratization of the Internet and of social media, no longer the only influential actor. Right? But that's. You know, my point about spin is that it doesn't matter who's speaking, whether it's even those players on the accountability side of the ledger or it's the political actors seeking to advance an agenda. There's always an element of uh, of interpretation and of subjectivity. And in the case of the main players who are advancing, uh, you know, a particular ag agenda, obviously they have an interest in a particular outcome and in what uh, Bernays referred to as the engineering of consent. Uh, you, you'll recall, of course, uh, you know, Chomsky kind of 
took that phrase and turned it into after Lipman actually into the well, manufacturing I, I, I want to move to, uh, to David and Esther for a response. Peter. Yeah. So, All right. so uh, David, uh, first to you, um, Peter's talking about uh, accountability mechanisms as being really crucial in this. And of course, the ultimate accountability in the liberal democratic system is, is voting and elections. Um, but, but the point that you made is, is that now in our political systems, uh, through social media and others, we've got these incredible development of extreme partisanship where most Republican voters believe the election was stolen. The, their identification with the Republican Party is greater than the adherence to what it's well established that things uh, were not stolen, but were run fairly. So in, in our system of liberal democracy encountering misinformation, uh, have we lost in many ways the ability of elections to hold people accountable because the system has now corrupted uh, uh, it so much in terms of extreme partisanship. Um, okay, there's a couple of things in there. I don't think that elections are the, the ultimate um, arbiter in liberal democracy. I think that dialogue among citizens is an essential part of democracy, and that's one of the things that's lacking. Um, uh, Peter talked about accountability, but I think one of the essential accountability mechanisms apart from the press and probably even more important than the press is, is dialogue among citizens. Um, and we live in a media environment that doesn't facilitate that. It, in fact, it works against that. We're sold that the new technology of today or smartphones and social media are democratizing um, technology, but I think that they're quite the opposite. I don't think that they, I mean, yes, it does put tools in the hands of people, um, individual citizens that they never had access to before, but I think they actually are much easier to manipulate by organized interest, well-heeled well organized interest than, um, than, we, than we're led to, to, to believe. If I were to organize a political campaign, and in fact, I was asked to do one last year, um, and I was given less than six months to do it. Uh, it certainly was a lot easier to put together a campaign using social media and new technology than I would have had before. Um, there is an antidote. Um, we can give up our social, or, or we can give up our phones, or we can stop thinking that our new technology is the answer to democracy. Learn to use traditional um, uh, political um, activities, you know, face-to-face -face conversations, going door to door the performative things of mass demonstrations and um, and social media campaigns, they are helpful. Uh, but a true candidate that has real relations with with um, the citizens in their constituency um, and can has a kind of credibility among um, people that they can they can get volunteers to come to the door, they will triumph over the AstroTurf campaigns that modern political organizers find so easy and convenient, efficient to, to do. Uh, but that requires, on one hand, the willingness of citizens and political activists to use those tools and to ignore the siren call of new media as the, the, the new democracy. Um, and ultimately, I don't see there is anything that we can do. I, I believe that journalists are doing um, and, and, uh, and traditional media organizations are doing terrific work to try and counter disinformation in the extremes of spin, but I don't think it's enough. I think it's a game of whack-a-mole, and until we change the business model that, uh, that uh, is employed in social media, we will always be behind the, uh, the A-ball on, uh, on that. It's just for a large institution operating across more than one campaign, uh, it's far more efficient to to run an astroturf campaign than a real political organization. So, David, you 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 have a, a hopeful sign that that there may be candidates and parties that take a different road uh, than what you call the astroturf social media. Do you have any evidence of that lately? Uh, well, the campaigns I was working on in a certain city in Canada. Uh, last year, um, the candidates that did best were ones that were genuine candidates with real links to the community who worked hard, were willing to go door to door. 
um, if you had two candidates of equal skill, um, but one was was backed by a large large organization, either domestic or foreign, um, uh, with media skills, new media skills, they would do better than um, the other uh, because it's not an it's not a level playing field. Uh, those with more money and more technical skills, or the, the the money to hire people with technical skills, can you know all other things being equal triumph over uh, you know the little guy. Uh, but um, you know there are things we can do to check um, the astroturf politics, but we're never going to put an end to it, and we may be in a worse situation until we compel the social media companies to to switch the middle, the business model from an advertising based model to a pay per use. Um, we'll have to give up on the free services, but um, those free services aren't really free. Uh, you know, your your data um, uh, is the is the is the gold in in that system. Mm. Esther, it, does the the distinction I, I I tried to make between three different kinds of issues, uh, spin and disinformation, and out, outright outright uh, lying. I, when you were talking about spin always being with us and uh, people pivoting, I I remember Henry Kissinger once at a press conference saying, "Does anybody have any questions to my answers?" I mean, he <laughs> had already decided what his message was, and the, the journalists were part of the photo op. Um, but how do you how do you uh, respond to the points that have been made uh, uh, around you? You were very um, uh, d definitive in talking about uh, how uh, journalists are trying to hold the the politicians and the spin masters accountable. Um, are they succeeding in your view as mainline journalism or legacy journalism? I've quoted the New York Times and so on. I mean that. That's and the CBC. That's what I listen to, but I think I'm fairly rare in that these days. At least, as David said, with young people, um, how how is the journalist profession doing in this new age? You no, know, not great. There, are, you know, I, again, I, I I said there's a lot of really excellent journalism based on accountability. But a couple of things strike me. I mean, as someone who worked in public broadcasting, I believe that you know it is the journalist journalism's role to affect that dialogue among citizens. That's what public broadcasting is supposed to be about. Um, even and even legacy media have been uh, been forced to or seduced by. Um, all the the bells and whistles of the technology uh which become very very difficult to, difficult to control and it also i was reflecting when um uh, peter was giving the various examples and i do believe there is a difference between uh mm. different kinds of spin uh that journalism didn't do itself any favors um uh, especially in the early the, the trump campaign and, and and as we began to see the polarization and, the, and truthiness and all the funny phrases that have come out since then um that to we we were not quick enough or definitive enough in calling things lies that were lies making mm. those decisions i remember reading many articles in the columbia journalism review and on the pointer website uh which you know deals a lot in in, in media ethics uh, around could you call the president a liar it didn't happen overnight Eventually, everybody went, phew, you know, the emperor really, pardon the, the cliche, you know, the, the emperor really is buck naked here. Um, so that happened, but it happened too late. We sort of got hoisted our, on our own petard in a way of, of uh, seeing ourselves as scribes, seeing as ourselves as having to be um, fair, fair to a fault without really, like with a false equivalence. Um, see, I've never, in all the years I've done, I've dealt with journalism ethics and taught journalists and taught students, I've never used the word objectivity. Well, maybe oh. never, but like next to it's not about being objective. Nobody is, as you pointed out. What we really have to do is ensure that there are enough perspectives and approaches 
um, represented so that it does affect dialogue, that it does give people different ways of looking at issues, that helps people understand how, how others see issues. I mean, you know, I'll tell you, it, it's outside the political realm, but if you ever really want to understand how um, these closed media systems have absolutely destroyed the, 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 you know, a search for truth or understanding, it's around issues like, um, well, my favorite when I was ombudsman was the like vaccination, right? And the anti-vaxxers. Right. And when you talk to in otherwise intelligent people and they say things to you like, I don't believe anything I read. I believe the mother next to me in the playground, right? Who's telling me. So like, what do you do about that? When, when, when emotion, so I don't think, I mean, I think there's lots of good stuff going on. And I think first principles will get us some distance, but you know, I, and that's why I'm not, I, I, I love, I mean, I love the work I do. I respect so many journalists, but I don't understand how we're going to have a real impact on the, on the whole ecosystem. It's so fragile mm -hmm. that, that, you know, I think we have a huge responsibility to educate people about what to look for, how to understand it, how to filter it. I mean, but, you know, I, I'm not sure what the effective tools for them. I honestly, I feel like I don't have any very few answers except to fall back, as I say, on the kind of basic tenets. But it's such a strange world where where your your, your truth is your own, and it's and, and feelings trump truth or fact very often, right? I mean, and invalidating other people's points of view too. Like it's, it's all gradation, right? At one yeah. point, you say, "Nah, not this." Right. Not this. This I will not say or report or give context to or try to understand. It's just outside. Right? That has its own dangers. But I'm I'm getting a lot more comfortable with uh, with saying there's and I and and certainly from the time I became ombudsman, uh, which was now about eight or nine years ago. I every person who, who wrote about climate denial, I would read the letter. I'm, I'm telling trade secrets here. I would read the letter carefully to ensure that there was no you know issue around honest fact like fact factual error or, or really bad framing or context and my standard answer was it would be as un um un, it would be not useful and as much and dishonest to give this any kind of equivalence right try to explain to people in my in my uh, my columns and whatever that that false equivalence is no is doing is also wise Right. So I was perfectly comfortable saying, no, this that this perspective will no longer be represented. It just, you know, it just isn't. It isn't valid. And and I think we're comfortable, you know, and people will push back. Well, what what if that changes, especially around things like like uh, vaccination and so on? So well, if there's new data, then we'll report it and we'll be wrong because our obligation is to tell truth as we know it, you know, based on fact and and analysis and understanding but things do change they absolutely do when, um, very. when esther talks about the the communication ecosystem or environmental system um just very recently um secretary general of the united nations was tasked by the general assembly i'm taking it up to the highest level i can think of of, of what the future agenda of the world should be looking forward and for the first time one of the key elements that was identified was misinformation. I mean, the Secretary General made the point, yes. how can we deal with public health issues? How can we deal with war and peace that Peter talked about uh, when we're in a tsunami of uh, misinformation through social media? But, uh, and this is my last point, and it's a hard one, his report uh, was heavy on analysis, very few ideas what to do about it. And so, we're coming uh, we're coming to the end but i want to throw it out uh do any of our panelists have ideas that we can counter the problems that we have so i think accurately described in this issue uh, of uh, spin if, if there was one thing you could do about it what would it be peter we'll, we'll, well just it, 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 it would be to fortify uh and 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 seriously improve and enrich our system of public education education is ultimately i mean it's it's the least sexy answer i can you know i can put to you but it's clearly the most important and it goes to what 
David talked about, which is the importance of citizens communicating with one another. Well, you know, the quality of that communication, of that dialogue will very much be a function of the quality of their education. And that education, you know, has to be not just in terms of, uh, uh, of teaching citizens how to think critically, but it also means inculcating in citizens uh, the, the core values that will enable them to be critical, successful, uh, democratic citizens. It's And how do we go about doing this? Well, that'll be for another panel. Maybe you'll invite me back to that one. But education is, is the answer. And, and of course, education is not the exclusive domain of the schools and of the school curricula. That's certainly part of it. All right. But it's much broader than that, much more ambitious. Mm -hmm. David, uh... What, I'm, what I to do about this political that, universe that you've described? <laughs> I agree with it, Peter. With Peter, that education is essential, but I would say that I'm, you know, I'm a strong believer in civics education. Uh, but I would say that until we change the the business model of social media, um, we're in a death spiral. Um, you know. As much as we can call people like Trump out for their <laughs> lies, um, he sells more media. He's more entertaining. Um, and he's going to get more hits. Even people who, if you're all you're seeing is Trump and you're watching him lie, uh, where, how, do you, how do you understand what he's lying about um, if, if that's all that dominates the news? But what does it take to change the business model? What's an alternative? Say you can't sell, uh, you can't sell advertising on social media. You want to communicate, uh, you pay for it. Right now, uh, the advertisers subsidize the social media platforms. But but advertisers have always subsidized communication mm -hmm. platforms, newspapers. Uh, and, uh, but I'm, some I'm, plat, you know, not not all forms of communication are equal. Um, you know, the social media is like a megaphone. It's almost like uh, taking a truck to a protest. It's, you know, as it's, it's not, we can have free, we had free speech without social media. Uh, and it's okay for, for me to send a text message to my friends, but it's not okay for, for me to forward um, garbage that's been, been created by an org, by a business or, or political institution that is designed as pure propaganda. Uh, I'd like to see more dialogue between individual citizens where we're, we're exchanging ideas. We're not just uh, sharing memes, images that, uh, and, and video clips that are increasingly easy to falsify and, and to make look professional and to, to grab attention. Esther, D David's calling for a whole new business model of changing the, the nature of advertising and uh, social media. Uh, is that feasible and what ideas in addition do you have? Well, I don't think so. It would be nice. I think what we can do is hold the big information purveyors, Google, Twitter, so on, uh, accountable more. Uh, your, the European community the, has, has tried to do that a lot more around privacy, right to be forgotten. Yeah. And I also twitch when I say that, by the way, because I'm obviously a very strong free speech uh, uh, but I do believe there there can be ways, and some of them may be monetary in the end, the like penalties, uh, to hold those uh, those platforms accountable for their content. I remember a few years ago being a big argument between uh, Facebook. You know, we, we are not uh, we're not journalistic. You can't hold us to those standards. Well, I say BS to that. Um, and maybe there is a whole other panel on how that what that accountability might look like. And what some well, of the other I things. I was just just reminded as well again very recently that our uh, governor general Ma Mary Simon uh, has got off social media and she had a, a conference because the attacks on her being a woman and an indigenous <laughs> so vile and so racist that she couldn't respond to it and one of the delegates to uh, her discussion from Costa Rica said well in our country we made it against the law. We investigated people who put up that kind of crap on social media and they couldn't get away. Well, as much as you can try to track them down, they couldn't get around because they were, uh, it was hate speech. Now, Canada just seems to have been behind the ball uh, on this on almost every conceivable front. Uh, just lastly, any reason why we seem to, 
this country seems to be so lethargic in standing up to the data folks and standing up for trying to protect journalists in general and women in particular from this just terrible hate speech on social media. Any quick comments on that before I wrap this up? Because we value freedom and we value freedom of expression. I think actually, I don't think we're worse in this department than some other liberal democracies are. Uh, we're struggling as are every, you know, all of all of our, you know, uh, comparable democracies around the world struggling with the balancing act between the protection of, you know, uh, of, of certain kinds of interests uh, and the promotion of uh, of certain values and certain sense, you know, public sensitivities. Um, on the one hand, and and the vital importance of, of, of free expression. And, and there is never a perfect balance uh, mm -hmm. that can be struck. It's always an ongoing uh, struggle. Well, thank you for contributing to Massey's modest contribution to seeing if we can get a balance uh, going forward. Uh, I, I appreciate your participation very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Enjoyed it. Thank it's you, been a Tom. real pleasure. Thank you for thank your you, thank you, Esther. Thank you.